Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth talk in Rice University's Planet Now webinar series featuring current conversations in environmental studies. My name is Richard Johnson. I'm the Sustainability Director at Rice. I also co-direct co the Environmental Studies Program, which is overseen by Rice's Center for Environmental Studies. The director of the Center for Environmental Studies is Dr. Joseph Campagna, and I want to thank him for his leadership and partnership. Student interest in the Environmental Studies Program at Rice is surging. Joe has done a remarkable job in overseeing the expansion of the program and in helping to create the Planet Now webinar series as a centerpiece of the center's outreach and engagement efforts. We are particularly grateful to the Humanities Research Center at Rice for helping to provide resources to make many of these opportunities possible, including through their diluvial Houston grant from the Mellon Foundation. We have a wonderful staff who have assisted in making tonight's program possible and want to be sure to recognize and to thank our colleagues in mission control behind the scenes, Andrew Steffel, John Waterhouse, Tara Usley, and Dr. Sean Smith. Our center and program are interdisciplinary in nature, and that is reflected in our joint home in the School of Architecture and the School of Humanities at Rice. I want to thank Deans John Kasparian and Kathleen Canning for their ongoing and unwaveringly enthusiastic support. Hundreds of people have tuned into the Planet Now series so far this fall, not just from Rice, but from cities and countries around the world. Tonight, we want to especially welcome alumni, students, prospective students, parents, and friends of the university who are joining us as part of the Owl Together celebration, which brings homecoming and reunion together with Families Weekend. Owl Together begins today and continues throughout the week with online events open to all alumni, students, parents, and friends. Welcome, everyone. We're really thrilled to have you here. We're grateful at Rice for this opportunity to share high quality, timely environmental content with you. Speaking of timely, tonight's edition of, Planet, of the Planet Now series deliberately connects with the election season by exploring the topic of Green New Deals. In the US, 23 states in the District of Columbia have already established economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions targets. Nine, nine states have set carbon neutrality goals, the most recent being Michigan in late September. And in August, our neighbor Louisiana also committed to become carbon neutral. A report published last month showed that around the world, over 800 cities, 100 regions, and 1,500 companies have committed to go carbon neutral. The companies represent over $11 trillion in revenues, which for comparison is about half of the US GDP or nearly 10% of the world GDP, so that's a big deal. The governments represented 11% of the global population. And then after the report was published, China announced that it would go carbon neutral by 2060. And just today, Japan announced their intentions to go carbon neutral by 2050. These are the second and third largest economies on the planet. So clearly there's something exciting happening here. To help us sort through all of this and to think about it at various scales, including at the federal level, we have a remarkable panel for you. I'll introduce our lead moderator and then turn the program over to him. We'll have brief presentations of about 12 to 15 minutes from each panelist, followed by time for questions and answers. So we encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A box. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Rick Wilson. Professor Wilson is interested in human behavior. In the past, his work focused on political history and the design of political institutions, especially the US Congress in the pre-federal and early federal period. His current work focuses on human cooperation and conflict, how timely. He has designed experiments that explore the development of cooperation in numerous bargaining games. This research has a strong cross-disciplinary cast and is supported by grants from the National Science Foundation and is facilitated by the Rice University Behavioral Research Laboratory. He has published articles in a wide range of scholarly journals. He is the president-elect of the Midwest Political Science Association and the past editor of the American Journal of Political Science. He also has a strong interest in environmental policies. This makes him the ideal host for tonight's election edition of Planet Now. Thank you for being here, Rick. I will now yield the virtual floor to you. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, I, I, I took on this task and sort of dreaded it at, at one 
point, but then after watching the presidential debates, um, I've decided my role as a moderator here is going to be really easy. So I have practically no work to do. Um, I'll keep uh, hopefully the speakers uh, lively and I'll try and get your questions uh, to them um, in, in, a, in a reasonable fashion. So it's um, my pleasure to first introduce uh, Daniel Cohen, who's an atmospheric scientist and an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering here at Rice. Uh, his research focuses on air pollution, climate change, and energy, and he's the author of a forthcoming book about addressing climate change in the United States. Uh, Dan has agreed to spend about 10 minutes or so uh, with some remarks, and uh, I'll turn over the floor to him. Thanks, Rick. appreciate the introduction and appreciate uh, seeing that there's so many people at this event. So imagine, if you will, that it's uh, January 21st, and we've just had a new president inaugurated and a new Congress come in. I know it's hard to imagine that these days with eight days left till election day and happy to entertain in, in the Q&A what might happen if there is a second term or other things. But um, if I'm imagining myself as being uh, presenting a vision to a, a president and a Congress that, that want to do the right thing on climate change and they want to know what should be done to get us in the right direction? What is it that they should do? And what I think it all boils down to is really four main aspects. It's a matter of setting standards, a matter of investment, a matter of justice and diplomacy. So what should those be? When it comes to standards, I think what Richard Johnson led us off with is exactly um, what the world is doing is what the US needs to catch up and be setting as our standard as well, as what's become the, uh, the global standard, what's become the global expectation of countries that are taking climate seriously has been to get to net zero. And you hear coalescing around a 2050 target. That's what the Euro European Union has set. That's what Japan has set. China last month decided they were going to get there by 2060. And so there's this emerging global consensus that that's roughly the time frame we need to aim for. And it's remarkable that that has become the expectation. It's nothing like what the expectation was um, just four years ago when uh, Obama in his final uh, months in office, he issued a plan of how to get to 80% emission reduction by 2050. And it was merely a goal. It wasn't set as a set in stone, something we were really committing to doing. Uh, he didn't have a uh, promise or a plan for getting to net zero back then it seemed wildly ambitious to aim for, uh, for an 80% reduction. Now we've had new reports come out. Now we know that getting to net zero around uh, 2050 or so is what it would take to hold warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. And um, probably with the rich countries getting there by 2050, that might be good enough to hold things below two degrees Celsius. So for the world to be on track of where we wanted to be for the Paris Agreement, that's the goal that it takes because CO2 is not like all the other air pollutants that I've studied throughout my career. The air pollutants where once we stop emitting them or slow down emitting them, they will um, work their way out of the air and the air will be cleaner. CO2 is something that lasts for centuries. It keeps building up, accumulating in the atmosphere until we can get it into a net zero balance between sources and sinks, until we're pulling as much out of the atmosphere whether by trees or by soils or by carbon sucking machines is what we put up there. So the only way we give our chance, our climate a chance to equilibrate to a new normal is to get to net zero. So that has to be the overarching goal of where we're aiming for. And within that overarching standard, it really comes down to a few um, building blocks, a few key uh, standards that are needed that, that make net zero possible. The vast majority of what we emit, the vast majority of what puts us so far from net zero today is from our energy systems, is that most of it comes from burning fossil fuels. And uh, right now our emissions as a country are about 6 billion tons per year. As a planet, it's uh, about 35 billion tons a year. So in the US, we're emitting a few thousand pounds per person per year. So we have to have an enormous shift to go from a few thousand pounds per person down towards zero. So what will that take? Well, 
Um, really, there are three main standards that have to come within that, three things that it, are going to be necessary if we're really going to get to net zero as a country. The first of those is that we have to set a target of getting to net zero electricity, is that we need the electricity supply to be a clean source. Until just a few years ago, electricity and power plants were the biggest source of carbon dioxide in this country. We've cleaned up a lot. We've been closing a lot of coal plants. Um, coal's actually been closing faster under President Trump than it has under any president in history. And we've been moving towards wind and solar and natural gas, but we need to accelerate that even further and get to um, fully clean electricity. We have a great chance to do that. Uh, we've been studying in my research group what it would take to add more wind and solar in Texas. I think geothermal has great opportunities to, to be a supplement to those. We've got a lot of hydropower and nuclear plants that are still around. So it's, it's very much doable, but it's something that's going to, to really take a commitment for making that the standard. And once you have clean electricity, it lets you do two other things. It lets you aim for an expectation that we're going to have clean cars and trucks and really moving towards an expectation of what you seeing, what you see some states doing, you see countries doing is, is getting to a future standard where we expect that we're going to have zero emitting vehicles. And it's possible that those might be some hydrogen fuel cells. It's more likely that, that the majority of those will be electric, but in either case, you need clean electricity to make that happen. You need clean electricity for electric vehicles, or you need clean electricity to, to make the hydrogen or both. So really the expectation of the clean electricity followed by an expectation that we're going to have clean vehicles. And the third that's not talked about quite as much is a need to um, get off of natural gas as what we use to heat our homes and businesses is that um, eventually we need to get to a point as heat pumps and other um, devices and, and efficiency make it possible that uh, that's going to be the biggest remaining consumer of fossil fuels in the, the commercial and residential sector. So having an expectation that we know that by a certain date in the future, we're going to be disconnecting from a residential uh, natural gas grid. So those, those are really the standards that we need to aim for, definitely other policies that go with it. So standards, and I said what comes next is investment. And then by investment, I truly do mean investment here. This is not pork barrel spending. This is not just spending money and having it go down a drain. This is money that needs to be spent now in order to save far more money in the future on top of the health benefits, on top of the cleaner air, on top of the cleaner water, the cooler climate that will come with them. Even just on dollar terms, these are investments that will more than pay for themselves. And what better time to invest than when interest rates are at historic lows, when we need investments to be bringing uh, new jobs, new high paying uh, clean energy jobs into the economy. So what will those biggest investments be? Well, if we need to be going to uh, a clean electricity supply, then that's going to mean we need a grid that is prepared for doing that. We're at a point now, and I think uh, popular opinion and, and, and political pundit opinion, opinion hasn't uh, caught up with this reality, is that we're now at a point where wind and solar are the cheapest forms of new electricity. If you were building an electric supply from scratch, you would never dream of building um, coal. Coal would be way too expensive to build. Even building a new natural gas plant is more expensive than wind or solar these days. But as, I did, as if I didn't need to be reminded for the 500th time, yes, I know the sun isn't always shining, the wind isn't always blowing. So to be able to tap into that cheapest forms of electricity, we need a grid, we need flexibility that brings them together. And different ways that I could go into detail of what that should entail, but it, it needs in part what some have called the super grid of extra lines. We don't need lines crisscrossing all the way across the country. We need some selective lines to be built and connect the grids we have so we can wheel around wind from one part of the country with solar in another part of the country. Because even though it's not windy all the time, it's not sunny all the time, there's virtually never a time when it's not windy or sunny somewhere in the country. And so we'll do as much as we can with transmission. We need storage also to, to blend in that as well. We need other flexible sources like keeping the nuclear and hydro plants that we have 
And I think the real sleeper in this is, is a need for geothermal or need an opportunity for geothermal, which um, could uh, benefit from a lot of the oil and gas expertise that we have, redirect that into, into geothermal energy. So we need to invest in that. We need to invest in electric charging infrastructure. We're just like we built out um, you know, the interstate highways, just like there was built out over time all the network that it took to be able to have the gasoline and diesel cars that we do today, we're going to need to prepare so that cars can run on electricity and perhaps heavy trucks running on hydrogen. And there's going to need to be an infrastructure that makes that possible. Because very soon we're going to get to the point where electric cars are as cheap or cheaper than internal combustion cars. But until there's that infrastructure, as you know, wherever you're driving, you have somewhere you can plug in, or if need be, somewhere to get your uh, hydrogen, if that takes off with trucks, that's going to be infrastructure, that's going to be investments that have to be spent now to create that infrastructure now, perhaps even more than there are cars demand for it, so that as those cars come out, um, more of that will happen. And the third biggest thing we're going to need to invest in is in research and development, is that there are some things that can take care of themselves. We're at a point with wind and solar now where by deploying them more, keeping down those cost curves, we're doing great. But we have other technologies um, like the batteries for electric cars that need to get better, like the geothermal technology, like negative emission technology. Because if we're gonna to get to a net zero balance, we're going to need something to offset the emissions we can't control. So that's gonna take research and development in those. I said the third, that there were four overall. So the third thing that we need to do is justice. And environmental justice has, I think, gotten more and more appreciation, but it's nowhere near the appreciation that it needs. And by that, what I mean is there is a need to be sure that we're not just doing this in a way of what's best for the planet overall, is that at global temperature, the benefit of bringing this down is something that the whole world enjoys. But we need to be sure that the communities that have been faced with with the worst air pollution, with the worst water pollution, with the worst waste pollution, that they're getting the benefit from this cleanup, that they're um, seeing those advantage. And the other piece that needs to be worked into a justice solution is transitions for communities that have been relying on um, fossil fuel industries that, um, that aren't going to be compatible with a uh, net zero future. And so finding ways that we transition, and I think just one example of it is a lot of the expertise from the oil and gas industry is, is perfectly suited towards the drilling that will be need, needed for uh, geothermal wells and for the offshore rigs uh, that can be the expertise. Uh, that can be the expertise for, um, for the offshore wind platform. So having a way that we ensure a just transition for all. And then finally, the fourth component that, that is so important is how do we take what we do in the United States and make it something that is on a global scale? How do we uh, take US efforts? And because the US is down to only one seventh of the global pie, what the US emits today is only one seventh of the world's emissions. So how can we take what we do as the United States and go from, you know, first off, not be the laggard anymore, not be the one who's the only country in the world trying to leave the Paris Agreement, but how do we take, once we do take things seriously and make what we're doing here be something that can be leveraged to help clean up the other six sevenths. And I think what we do with the energy research and development, what we do with uh, the standards, with creating a market, being the biggest consumer market and knowing that there will be a market for these clean cars, for these clean forms of energy, and, uh, but it's really going to take getting together and at the next uh, follow up to the Paris Agreement, which is going to be in the UK in November, 2021. And really at every other chance there is to have diplomacy to work trade deals um, is to really make this an integral part of, of what US diplomacy is all about and you know, be willing to, to, to push that, make that push because it's what's best for our country but to really insist both internationally and I would prefer uh, through the creation of some climate clubs working with, with a coalition of the willing to uh, move back into a vanguard of, of where we're moving things forward, where we're making it um, affordable and a fair playing field for, for all the countries that, that will join us in a commitment to, to move towards 
net zero. So I really see those as being uh, the four main components of what it will take. Um, you'll notice that some economists in the room might say, well, you didn't uh, mention a carbon tax. I agree with the economists who say that would be the most cost-effective way to meet some of these, that if we're really aiming towards getting to clean electricity, that a carbon tax would be a very natural way. That is one of the tools that it would take um, to get there. But we aren't gonna be able to wait if, that, if there isn't the, the votes in Congress to get that passed. We can't wait until that passes. We can have these standards, we can make these commitments. And once they're set in place, once you commit that we're moving towards clean electricity, that you're moving towards uh, clean vehicles and so forth, that's going to naturally uh, take rise is that that's one of the tools that could get us there. But you're not going to sell the politics just on, on eating your vegetables. You're not gonna sell, set the politics based on the tool. You have to get people realizing the benefits, the clean air, the clean water, the cooler climate, the jobs, the environmental justice that we're aiming for and the others um, can follow suit. So appreciate you taking the time to listen to that vision of what might happen. Uh, really mostly look forward to hearing what Jim Blackburn has to say and looking forward to the, the questions and discussion that emerge. So thank you. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, that gives us a lot of food for thought. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Jim Blackburn. Uh, Jim is an environmental lawyer and planner. Uh, he's a professor in the practice of environmental law and the civil and environmental engineering um, department. He's also the co-director of the Severe Storm Prevention, Education, and Evacuation from Disaster Center, the, the SPEED Center. He's also director of the undergraduate minor in energy and water sustainability uh, at Rice, and he's been active at Rice for some time. He goes back even further than I, so it's my pleasure. Jim, turn the floor over to you. You bet. Well, thanks, Rick. I, I appreciate it, and uh, good evening to everyone. And, and Dan, that was a great uh, kickoff for us. Um, I'm going to come at this from a little different perspective. Um, I, I think my biggest worry, and, and there are several, uh, about this election is the polarization that precedes it and the polarization that we have now. And I could see climate becoming a tremendously polarizing issue in the future. Um, and I don't want that. I think that there are ways that we can move forward with climate and not have it be an absolutely um, kind of divisive concept. It's been divisive for too long in this country. And we have to find ways, I think, to bring everyone together on climate rather than to, uh, to set, each, set ourselves, set each, set each other against each other. Um, one of the most important observations about the Trump administration, and it's certainly possible that Donald Trump would be reelected. And, um, and I think it's very interesting that essentially the corporate community is building patches to climate and to climate solutions around the policies of the federal government, which are not helpful at all. Uh, Donald Trump has done more to move us against uh, climate uh, progress. Uh, much of the progress that was made during the Obama administration, uh, the Trump administration has just been undoing act after act after act, uh, regulations, executive orders. And uh, there would be no reason to think they wouldn't continue to do that in the future. But is there's almost been a quiet revolution in the corporate uh, world with regard to the way in which the corporations are responding, you might say around the federal government. It's almost like you know, wiring around uh, you know, a, a system that's not working. And to some extent, the federal government has become, I think, less and less important in a lot of corporate thinking about these issues. And the corporations are having to find their own pathways. I think they're also getting financial signals. Uh, what I have found, I have talked a whole lot about environment. I've talked a lot about climate. And I have probably turned off more audiences in downtown Houston than uh, just about any speaker you could think of. Uh, but it is incredibly important if I can talk in a way that I don't turn the audience off initially, it's a, it makes a huge difference. 
So if I come in and talk about money and climate, I can have a conversation with anyone in Texas. I can have a conversation with anyone in the United States. And so I think if we could come together and find the positive signals to start with. Now, there's a lot of my environmental friends that think that talking money and climate is heresy. That, you know, it's just not the right, it's supposed to be done for the right reasons. We're supposed to go and do this because it's the right thing to do. And I have litigated on the right thing to do for much of my career. Um, but it's amazing how fast corporations change to follow the money. And the money is sending signals right now that taking care of climate, addressing climate, coming up with bona fide solid climate policies, it, that is beginning to penetrate. And so I would simply say, if Donald Trump is reelected, you will see more and more of the corporate workarounds and I think corporations will end up heading in the right direction. Now, I don't think we'll get there alone. I think though that what the corporations are doing lays a basis for where we should be building from as opposed to going in and restarting and rethinking and restructuring everything. That corporate structure that has emerged, that pursuit, if you will, of financial gain in the a reduction of climate impacts is something that I think can be worked on, worked with, it should be. So I would put economic considerations at the centerpiece of any type of climate policy going forward. And I say that in the following way, there's a lot of new jobs to be created. We need new jobs, we need new ways of thinking about economy. There is a way to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the agricultural community. We could set up transactions whereby farmers and ranchers would be paid for putting carbon dioxide in the soil. Uh, right now, there's not a good system for that. We've been working on that over at the Baker Institute at Rice University. We have a working group that has been uh, basically developing a standard for uh, storing carbon dioxide in the soil that has been removed by photosynthesis. Uh, the oil and gas industry didn't think of uh, photosynthesis as being a particularly attractive alternative when I first started working on it about 10 years ago. Uh, but I think photosynthesis has the potential appropriately addressed to offer a major contribution to removal and storage of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's carbon capture and storage. And I think the agricultural community of the United States can be a key piece of it. We need transitions. We need bridging concepts and the use of the agricultural community to basically come in and organize to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it in basically every bit of available soil that we can find. I think would be a fabulous solution. There are cattle grazing techniques that can optimize the removal and storage of carbon dioxide in the soil. There are all types of, I think, innovations that are possible in this space. The United States federal government spends $20 billion a year in agricultural subsidies. Those subsidies could and should be directed uh, toward the storage and removal of carbon dioxide. So I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there and that works positively uh, in the red states. That works positively in the states of the United States that are probably the least inclined to do something about climate. The, the, the heartland, if you will. So I would start off by saying, I think that is a key consideration. Now I've spent 40 years litigating environmental issues in federal court. Uh, I've probably settled more environmental cases. I've also probably litigated more environmental cases than probably most any other environmental attorney I could think of. And I've got some real questions about reliance too much on the legal system to solve all these problems. So. It is unusual for me to talk about economy as a positive solution. And that's something I have sort of come to in the last five years. Now, at the federal level, assuming that the Biden uh, administration gets brought in, uh, one of the things I'm most concerned about, actually there's two that I'm most concerned about. One is vindictiveness. Uh, we do not need to be vindictive in our climate policy. We've got problems to solve. We've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to get those done. Vindictive is what litigation is about a lot of times. I have seen vindictive. And vindictive 
leaves bitterness. And there's bitterness out there right now about what has been done. There can be a lot more bitterness if we keep going from one side of the spectrum to the other. I like a concept called the radical center. I think that the ideas that we need to, to create, they're important. They're gonna be difficult, but I think they need to be merged out of compromise. I think they need to be merged out of the middle uh, rather than spawned at the edges. And, uh, you know, so I, I heard uh, a group out of New Mexico came up with the concept of radical center. And I think it's one of the most interesting concepts I've run across. Carbon neutral by 2050, absolutely. Uh, carbon neutral by 2050 has to be the goal that we pursue. Uh, the United States should sign up as soon as it can. I don't think it will sign up under the Trump administration. Uh, so if Trump's reelected, you won't see it. Uh, but I think we should, should commit absolutely to doing that. I'm already seeing more and more pressure toward 2035. Uh, I'm seeing more pressure toward 50% by 2030. I think those types of movements are going to become more and more powerful. There may easily be a limit to who is going to be emerging in terms of the economy of the 21st century. We could easily lose a significant number of our industries. And I think the industries that get out in front of these issues, the industries that are uh, kind of forward looking, the industries that go out and secure carbon sequestration rights at a relatively inexpensive uh, rate, as opposed to the cost of well over $100 a ton for technological carbon uh, capture and storage. I think those are gonna be the ones that succeed. Uh, I think that at the federal level, we ought to absolutely restore methane controls that have been stripped away. Uh, I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. And there's an act called the Growing Climate Solutions Act that has been introduced by both uh, uh, two Republican and two Democratic uh, senators. Uh, that is about getting the United States um, Department of Agriculture directly involved in the oversight of the storage of carbon dioxide in the soil and the removal the certification of those types of systems. I think that is an excellent type of act to go forward with. Um, I think that we've gotta be careful going forward. Uh, one of the things I'm most concerned about the so-called Green New Deal is that social issues are mixed right in with the climate issues. And my experience has been that laws are best when they are specific, when they are targeted, and when they're focused. I think trying to solve all problems that we have in our society with a single legislative act is, um, is going to disservice. Uh, I love the concepts that are put forward. I think that the concepts are great. I think in terms of actually implementation, the implementation should be much more cautious and should be much more targeted uh, statute by statute concept by con concept almost, and basically divide the Green New Deal concepts into multiple acts and pass them on their own merits and address and basically make them work for this, uh, for all the subjects as well as we possibly can. At the state of Texas level, I don't anticipate much action. I don't see much action coming. Um, probably most interestingly, the commissioner of the general land office, uh, Commissioner Bush, uh, owns a lot of land the use of that land in a climate sensitive way could be very interesting. Uh, Jody Smith, the um, land commissioner from North Dakota just contacted us at the Baker Institute working group that we've got on soil carbon. And she's fascinated with the concept of trying to use the 700,000 acres of land that they've got in North Dakota to try to work with the industry that she's got in North Dakota to try to find solutions that uh, would help um, uh, the oil and gas industry and the transition, um, money is getting harder to raise, uh, rightly so, for uh, oil and gas projects. And it's going to take a carbon concept, a carbon capture concept, a carbon management concept to succeed in the future. She wants to help her uh, companies find those ways to success. I think that's something that, that all of us ought to be thinking about a bit. At the local level, I would like to see local governments take the lead in carbon neutral thinking. Uh, carbon neutral is an important concept. 
Uh, carbon neutral is something that a lot of the corporations are talking about. Um, step one, of course, is carbon footprinting. Then you've got to find out what you can avoid, what you can minimize, and ultimately what you can mitigate. Everyone should have a carbon footprint analysis completed. I would bet many of our governments do not. Governments should be at the lead of that. They shouldn't be at the last in line, which is where they are right now. Uh, most of our corporations have an excellent set of data on corporate footprinting. Uh, many of them are beginning to take steps, however, small those first steps may be. But, but I expect to see this to accelerate significantly. Um, I think in closing, what I would just like to, to urge is cautiousness and carefulness going forward. I think there is a tendency, a tendency to swing the pendulum all the way back uh, from, where, from where it is currently. And I think at some point we're gonna to have to stop these uh, kind of radical pendulum swings and really come up with something that's creative. What we need is vision. Uh, I think the thing we have done most poorly is that we have failed to uh, really paint a picture of what a green future would look like a green future where people are employed, a green future where we have a lifestyle that is a reasonable one. Uh, and I, I think that, that we've done poorly. I think the best I've ever seen done on that, I think Tesla has one of the most interesting images about kind of what the future might look like. And it's very much like the, the present, uh, except that it's, it's all about solar. It's all about electricity. It's what Dan was describing. It's just, I don't think that we have an image in our heads yet. And I think there's a role for art. I think there's a role for, for poetry. I think there's a role for, I think all of us to become engaged in finding and making these solutions. Because ultimately we're gonna have to create a world that we wanna live in. So that's what I've got. Great, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think we, we've we got a s bunch of questions that have come in now, and so I'm going to throw some out, but, but let me start with this and maybe get both of you to address it. Um, we saw in the last uh, presidential debate that climate change was actually one of the main questions that, that, that came to the fore, and there was some discussion back and forth uh, by, the, uh, by both candidates. Um, and I wonder if this is a positive thing or, or a negative thing. I didn't hear much from either candidate uh, that would make me maybe as optimistic as uh, Dan might be. Um, and I want to get to maybe a little bit of pessimism in, in, in Jim's comments in a little bit. So let me throw out to both of you, what did you think of the responses uh, in, the, in the debate? And do you, do you think it has had much of an impact on the American electorate? It's kind of a long-winded question, sorry. I would just start off by saying, I don't think it had a lot of impact on the American electorate, except in the following way. I, I think linked with COVID, I think there's the whole question of the role of science in society. And I think that if anything, there's a challenge to the university coming back back out of that, that we maybe haven't done a very good job of putting science forward in a lot of these discussions. But, but I think to some extent, uh, science has been the loser in these discussions and these debates. And to turn it around and to kind of restore faith in science, I think is one of the real challenges going forward. So I'm not sure if that's a direct answer to your question, Rick, but it's kind of what I got out of it is you link, you know, kind of our responses to COVID, the government's responses to COVID. And, and you know, I mean, on the one hand, you've got um, science being touted and then tout science being flaunted. And, and you know, it's happened, it's almost the exact same thing with climate. So I think until we solve the science issue, we're maybe not getting too far, but that's, that's me. Yeah, I guess I've seen a lot of discussion that, oh, it was great that climate change finally came up in a debate, which is so long overdue, you know, behind COVID, it's got to be the top or one of the top top three issues facing society. How is it ignored so much? But I find it 
very empty and very disappointing the way it does come up. Uh, the way it came up um, early on was the question of, do you believe in blank? And I think as scientists, we always cringe when this becomes a, a question of, of belief. To me, it's a question of, do you accept or do you acknowledge um, established facts of climate science? And whether they do or not, the, the bigger question is, well, what are we going to do about it? What are the policies going forward? And even in this latest debate, it, it was more policy oriented, but we haven't been able to have a, a meaningful debate um, because um, frankly, you know, from one side, the answers are nonsense. Uh, we heard about the teeny tiny windows and the the fumes spewing out of wind turbines. I don't know what he's talking about. Um, so I would love to have a debate where there are, you know, I think very valid things that that should be debated. What's what's the role of of market based measures? What exactly should should our targets be? Where should we be focusing our research? Um, and it was dismaying to see how we really didn't get there at any point in this cycle. And I, I went back and I read uh, the transcript of the debate from 1988 and. Uh, but Boyd Benson and Dan Quayle debating in, uh, you know, uh, what is that, 30, 32 years ago. And they had a more sensible, more, um, more coherent debate. And I know Dan Quayle wasn't, wasn't thought of as, as uh, you know, the brightest luminary, but what he was saying uh, should be done on climate was worlds ahead of, of what Republican candidates have said recently. So, um, you know, it, it's good to have it in the discussion, but I hope that we get to a point where in future elections, it's, it's between two candidates who both accept that climate is real, that, uh, that we need to act on it, and, and we can be debating real solutions. Let me paraphrase one of the questions that came in from the audience, and that's that, um, does it matter really who wins the election if it's the case that corporations are already moving ahead. BP has announced that, you know, it's divesting basically in fossil fuels. It's turning to other energy sources. Uh, other, other corporations are recognizing that uh, there's no, not going to be any money in it uh, to, to continue current practices. So do elections even matter? Who wants to handle that one? <laughs> I think this one absolutely does matter, and and perhaps this is a chance to to maybe draw some contrast with with some of the comments that Jim was was raising. Is that it's wonderful that that cities and states and and corporations are making these pledges, but the enormity of the challenge isn't something that can be addressed by by these corporate pledges alone. I was there. Um, in uh, San Francisco, when when Bloomberg introduced the um, uh, a plan that they had the the we, I don't know, we are still in or it was something where they were showing um, what they thought could be achieved by businesses, cities, and states doing everything possible, and we're trying to show that we were still on a path towards Paris, even though the federal government wasn't acting. And this booklet that they introduced at this press conference, they had Carl Pope there, head, former head of the Sierra Club, all these luminaries, and it showed. If we have each of these 10 most hopeful, you know, wish list of what cities and states and businesses could do, it would get us two or 3% per year reduction. So it would definitely get us better to where we are. It would definitely move the, the ball a bit forward. But if we're really serious about, about what needs to be done for climate and really, you know, holding things to one and a half or two degrees warming rather than three, um, it's gonna take a lot more than voluntary measures. It's gonna take a lot more than what the soils can hold. It's going to take things that really are more efficient and can be done um, cheaper, more effectively, better for health, better outcomes if they're coordinated. Um, just like you know, we, we need an interstate highway system to even, even if businesses are deciding to, to buy their own vehicles, we can't efficient, and, and sure, a Google and Apple can go out and buy it's renewable electricity, but to have a system that works as a country that keeps the lights on, keeps things affordable um, nationwide, it, it does take, there is a federal role. It's, it's not all federal, but there's a federal role to have that be planned out, to have an expectation that we're going to be moving to, uh, to clean vehicles, to clean electricity, and, and that we get the infrastructure that goes with it. Um, yeah, you know, if we're left with another four years of Trump, then that we will need to be doing those things to get us forward. But but I think 
there is a federal role that can help help this go a lot better. And, and let me be clear. I'm not saying that there's not a federal role. What I'm saying is that there's things that are already underway. And what I am really afraid of is that a, a, a really aggressive federal role will screw up and derail what's underway. And I think there's a better way at the federal level of coming in. I would love to see a massive amounts of money put into these issues. I think there's no question that that is a role for the federal government. I'd like to see a carbon tax. I'd like to see a number of things. I, what I don't wanna see is vindictive policies that come in and basically take what progress is being made and cut it off and say, we've got to go a totally different way. I think there's a way to work with what's going on right now that is much better. And I probably didn't get do a good job of saying that, but that is an important piece. Rick, can I jump in with one? Sure. Well, um, one thing that neither of you really had an opportunity to address, but in our last two talks, um, when we had Lad Keith from the University of Arizona talking about um, urban heat, and then Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, a lot of ocean focused, and um, neither of you had an opportunity to really talk about um, adaptation and mitigation. And there's a lot of risk, and the financial markets are responding to that risk. Uh, you know, Jim raised that, but there's property risk, infrastructure risk, health risk. Um, and so, um, you know, what should we be doing in that regard, whether it's in, in greater Houston or, or elsewhere, because we're, you know, we're, uh, you know, what the data showed, Hurricane Harvey was 15% or so more, uh, more intense from a rainfall perspective because of climate change. And we've got risk, increased risks of, of fires, vulnerable facilities. Um, the effects that urban heat have on um, on populations. So, um, wh where where does that fit into um, to how you uh, you know to your your perspectives? Well, Bob, I'll jump in on that one quickly. We've done a lot of work on that over at Speed Center at Rice, and um, I mean, I think there's a huge role one for the federal government in terms of uh, providing the infrastructure. Um, you know. Houston is vulnerable to hurricane surge as well as for uh, rainfall flooding. If we don't admit the climate is changing and try to get in front of climate change to look forward about these rainfall events, to look forward about these hurricane events and to project in 10, 20, 30 years what these storms are going to be like. If we don't have that discussion, then we're gonna be wasting a lot of money building inadequate facilities. And so I think the biggest harm that's been done so far is that our failure, particularly in Texas, is you know, uh, in, in our community, we haven't talked honestly about climate and climate change. And I think understanding those changes is something that I'm just amazed at how little people understand about what climate change will, will actually mean. Uh, I think most people perceive the rain's changing a bit. Uh, but in terms of sea level rise and the fact that we may well be looking at just almost daily inundation of our island communities by 2050, 2060, where you know, they, the high tides will be coming up over the current roadway system, kind of what that looks like, the vulnerability of the Clear Lake area in Houston. I mean, those are things that we just don't talk about and we, you know, that, that should be talked about. So I think in a way, the biggest problem of the federal government, and I would throw the state government absolutely in there, uh, is that we don't talk honestly about these issues and we cannot expect to solve these problems if we don't talk honestly about them. So I agree with everything people ask, that Jim said, and, and I, would, I would add that... Um, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, it's another way to frame it and, and agree with all the points that, that Jim made on that, um, is we haven't adapted yet for one degree of warming. We've already had one degree Celsius, two degrees Fahrenheit of warming, and the way we see our systems breaking down, the way we see California and Colorado in the West unprepared for wildfires, the way we see all up and down the Gulf Coast unprepared for for hurricanes. You know, this is this is just one degree of warming so far, and I think if we do the best we can as a world to hold warming, we're probably not going to hold it much below two degrees. So we have another 
we have a, a doubling of the amount of warming we've had so far yet to come. And and I feel when I go to the the flood meetings, the um, you know seeing preparing for how do we need to change the flood maps, they're just trying to catch up to where the climate is yeah, exactly. in 2020. And there's really not the preparation needed of what's the climate going to be in 2100 in that best case scenario where we really take this seriously and we do these you know, enormous steps that that have more benefits than harm, but, but it's enormous leap to get to where we hold warming below two. And if we don't do those, then we're we're on pace for, for three degrees warming or five and a half Fahrenheit of warming. And so I think, you know, the the rule of thumb is adapt for two and or mitigate for two, but adapt for three is that we need to be planning for adaptation as if, you know, maybe some of the world doesn't come along with doing that and and we have to repair for that. And in this part of the country, I think what I'm what brightens me most is just how quickly I've been seeing hurricanes intensifying. Is these rapid yeah. intensification events, is that's that's the telltale sign of of a warmer planet. We won't necessarily have more tropical storms or less than before, but this this ability of storms to brew up and and go from from a small tropical depression into a category four hurricane, like we saw with Hurricane Laura, that, that could just as easily have, have hit us the way it devastated um, Lake Charles. Um, it, it's a lot that's, that our region needs to be preparing for that, that right. it's only going to get more challenging as we go forward. And those quick storms really do mess up evacuation because you just don't get the warning. So a number of people have asked, um, what do you think of, of Houston's climate action plan? Now, l let me frame it kind of this way. Um, both of you see that there's a, an important role played by the federal government and um, international institutions in pushing things forward. But we also kind of know that uh, through diffusion of policy that much of what happens that's innovative comes, uh, comes at the state level or sometimes at the local level uh, in, in pushing change. Is that just too little too late? Uh, or is the is Houston's climate action plan trying to get get its uh, get its head around the problems we'll face? Well, let me let me start by saying that I, I think we absolutely I think it's a, a nice plan, it's a nice start. Um, you know, I think it's some I think it's a legitimate role for a government that doesn't have a whole lot of power. So, I mean, you know, it, it is a nice step. I think perhaps more importantly was what the Houston Partnership did and what Bobby Tudor did as the head of the partnership and coming out and basically talking for the first time in Houston about us becoming a center of carbon uh, kind of uh, sequestration and carbon, uh, carbon thinking, uh, not just in terms of producing hydrocarbons, but in terms of addressing the, the impact. Uh, that discussion was, I think, about 10 times more important than the city's plan, just simply because it opened a conversation that had, frankly, just almost been impossible to have prior to that time. So I think symbolism, at least where we are in Houston, is huge. And I think that that speech by Bobby Tudor back, uh, back in January at the Houston Partnership, kind of, I guess it was kind of state of the um, economy of, of the region speech, uh, I, I think that is really perhaps the most important step that we've seen in our part of the world in a long time. I think the plan set the right uh, targets. It set, you know, aim of carbon neutral by 2050. It's, uh, I think the capital C city is taking steps to reduce their own footprint, but the city, the municipal government footprint is, is small compared to the region. What I don't see happening yet is the two things that I think a city needs to do to make it possible for its citizens to reduce their footprint. And the two biggest things I think a city should be doing is, is one, making it so that are, the building codes, the expectations of what is built um, move us towards more efficiency and less reliance on fossil fuels. And I, I haven't seen the follow through yet with, with building codes. And the second thing is making this a city that's, that's friendly where it's um, easier to use zero emission vehicles. So you know, making it so that, that there are more places to, um, to charge up that enable that technology. And, and so I guess that's where I would like to see more follow through in the years ahead. So let me take a slightly different cut on this. Both of you mentioned 
mentioned, you know, the importance of the U.S. Uh, federal government maybe showing leadership uh, to the world in um, setting goals and trying to meet those goals. Um, but what's that mean for developing countries, uh, countries that may want many of the same things that, you know, the U.S. has enjoyed, or China, for that matter, has enjoyed over the past 20 years? Um, where do they fit in? I think a couple of things are important there. I think it's a great question um, because that's where the growth and emissions is going to come. I do a uh, Sea Roads climate simulation with my classes each semester where they each play the role of a different part of the world. And you look at the future projections and you know the, the developing parts of the world uh, over time as their populations are growing, their economies are growing, are going to dwarf what's expected of future emissions in the United States. So finding some way that they can develop in ways that don't take our um, coal and, and, and other fossil fuel approach, but, but sort of leapfrog that step and get to, to growing economies that aren't so reliant on fossil fuels, just like they've jumped over landmines straight to cell phones. Uh, I think you know, there's a role for the wealthier countries to play in making that possible. I think the research and development that we do here and the, the testing out and, and the demonstrating those technologies in the US makes it more affordable abroad. And I think we need trade policies and technology transfer that make, make that happen. That in some ways this isn't, um, there are some where, ways where you want to be able to make something best and sell it for the highest price possible around the world. But in this case, if we get better battery technologies and we get better um, technologies for efficiency and so on, anything possible that makes that so that those can be adopted uh, as cheaply and readily in the rest of the world, it's in our our collective best interest to make that happen. And, and I would just throw up the, you know, certainly, I think the example about going straight from um, from landlines to cell phones and, and in really skipping all of that huge infrastructure development as an example of what could be done is, is great. And I, I think that we need to be very vigilant about transferring technology rather than simply trying to always protect that technology and, and that that's a tricky tricky balance that uh, we've never been particularly good at but what i'm particularly concerned about are some of the you're talking about climate adaptation some of the climate impacts that we're going to be seeing uh in the developing world where there's going to be mass exodus of people from lower lying areas uh particularly about bangladesh uh is particularly of concern places like that and i think we are going to have to take a major role in the in a global sense of providing economic relief. And that is also that's something we've moved away from. And I, I see again coming in and helping uh, other countries adapt to things that frankly they didn't cause. Uh, and I think that if we take responsibility, it is an that's an important responsibility to take. Great, I think we have time for just one last question and it kind of dovetails with what you uh, both just said. Uh, you talked about the importance of, uh, of, of technology transfer, et cetera, but what if there's a, the flip side to that? What can the federal government do or states or local entities if there are new innovations that make fossil fuel energy even more advantageous and cheaper? In other words, new developments that suddenly open up new deposits uh, and, and lead to a second wave, third wave of, of um, um, uh, fossil fuel usage, contrary to what you both have in mind. Well, I would start by saying that that's where carbon capture and removal become so important. Uh, I mean, I have not totally written off the petroleum industry. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't see it as the the, the key to the uh, you know the economy of the twenty uh, the end of the twenty first century beyond. But if we can figure out how to basically take those impacts away, if we can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. I mean, the concept that I'm very interested in is a is a carbon negative economy where we're taking more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than we're you know than we're putting up in that we began to remove and, and cure and, and attempt to anyway. Uh, I'm not saying I think it's, it's feasible, 
but I think as a goal, as something to, to look for, uh, I would love to see that. Um, I'm not sure I think it's feasible, but I think that's the only way that there's going to be a, a viable hydrocarbon future is it's got to be neutral, if not negative. I think, I think we're already in the world that you described. We're already in a world where there's unbelievable abundance of very, very cheap fossil fuels. If by cheap, we mean ignoring the effect it has on our water, ignoring the effect it has on our air, ignoring the waste, ignoring the health, ignoring the climate, it's already there. Um, there is enormous amounts of coal in this country and the Powder River Basin coal that we're bringing in from Wyoming to our Texas power plants, that sells for about $10 a ton, okay? Pennies per pound, it's hard to find dirt that cheap. Gasoline, if you go to a gasoline station, gasoline's the cheapest liquid that you can buy there. Cheaper that the gallon of gasoline is cheaper than you'll pay for a gallon of milk or orange juice or bottled water. Okay, natural gas. When I, my early years of teaching my energy and environment class, I was talking about natural gas going to $15 a million BTU and how would we deal as it kept going higher and higher? It's two bucks now. It's super cheap. That the reason why they're venting so much methane out in West Texas or flaring it is because it's hardly worth the cost of moving it to consumers. So we are already in a world that is awash in cheap fossil fuels. And we need to find a way that, that we decide as a society that we're not moving away from them because the raw price, ignoring all the damage that they do in externalities is too high. That we didn't end, we didn't move on from the stone age because we ran out of stones. And we can't count on ending the fossil fuel age because we've run out of, of cheap fossil fuels. We need to have a way that we decide this is a different future that we want. It is absolutely at a point now where it's affordable to do, where it would lead to uh, better jobs, cleaner air, cleaner water, and a cooler climate. So we need to do it for those reasons, not because we're afraid that they're suddenly going to get expensive or we're suddenly going to run out of fossil fuels. We, we can't rate, wait until we run out of those fossils. Well, great. Thank you both. This has uh, been a very enlightening discussion. Uh, my role as moderator is about over. My last word of wisdom to everyone would be go vote. It's that simple. I'll turn it back to you, Richard. Thank you. Um, before everyone leaves, uh, I want to encourage you to register for our next Planet Now session, which is entitled Ecologies of the Global South. Um, it is on uh, Monday, November the 2nd at 6 p.m. That's the day uh, before election day, of course. So uh, as we just said, if you, if you don't have your plan in place, get your plan in place so that you can vote. Uh, Ecologies of the Global South will feature Jennifer French. She's a professor of Spanish at Williams College. She's a literary critic whose research explores the ways that colonialism and neocolonialism have influenced relations among human groups and between humans and non-human nature in Latin America. And she'll be joined by um, Kajitan Aiheka, the Associate Professor of English at Yale University, whose research and teaching focus on African and Caribbean literatures and film, post-colonial studies, eco-criticism, eco-media, and world literature. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first day of the Owl Together Week. So the School of Humanities has a robust series of offerings for you. So you can find the listing of this week's um, events at humanities.rice.edu slash owl-together. Um, and I think that will pop up in the, uh, in the chat. Um, I would like to draw your attention in particular to Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. Uh, for an event called Rice Talks, the Environment. And that features uh, Joe Campana of the Center for Environmental Studies, um, also a professor of English, Sylvia D from um, uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences, and uh, Andrea Baistero from Anthropology in the School of Social Sciences. I want to thank my colleagues Rick Wilson, Dan Cohan, Jim Blackburn, for taking the time to participate in Planet Now this evening. We at the Center for Environmental Studies are grateful for their environmental leadership on campus and are honored by their presence this evening. Those of you who are prospective students who are tuning in, these are some of the fabulous faculty members uh, from whom you can take courses. Um, finally, for our audience, thank you for tuning in to Planet Now. We appreciate that you cho chose to give us an hour and six minutes of your time. And we hope that you've concluded that it was time well spent. 
We look forward to seeing you again on November the 2nd. And again, if you haven't already done so, go vote, it matters. From Rice University in Houston, good night, everyone.